365 days. That's the number of days in a year. Sure, 2024 is a leap year, and thus we have February the 29th being day 366, but that's just another room to me. In 2024, I decided to take on a challenge, designing a mega dungeon, with a room for each day on the calendar. Welcome, mates, to the design floor for 2024. Before we get started on summarizing the dungeon design undertaken in the month of January, we need to discuss how we're setting up the dungeon, namely the rules, the restrictions, and any other considerations that are important. The first consideration is the theme for the dungeon, since this will determine what tabletop roleplaying systems are compatible. Because as hilarious as it would be to roam through a medieval fantasy dungeon as a space marine from the Warhammer series, well, to say that would be jarring would be an understatement. In my case, I've decided to go for a medieval fantasy adventure, set out in a desert of mystery. With that, let's now take a moment to talk about the second consideration, the design goals for the dungeon. The end goal for this is to design a mega dungeon that, whilst made with a particular system in mind, can be flexible enough to be system agnostic. So even though we're designing this dungeon with Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition in mind, We'll keep the dungeon and other content as generalized as possible to make adapting it to an alternative system as easy and streamlined as we can. The next consideration is that I want to design the dungeon with player character spotlight sharing in mind. What do I mean by that? Well, say we have a room that has an obstacle that requires climbing to reach a switch. If the party has a character with flight, such as an Arakokra, that's a potential shortcut the party can take that also allows the birdfolk a moment in the spotlight. This also means that we shouldn't design the dungeon for whatever example party we make. None of the obstacles should require a particular trait granted by an ancestry or a highly specific spell such as exclusively fireball, and no other fire magic or alternative spell works, as hilariously jarring as that would be. This also means that we should design any puzzles in the dungeon such that the mechanics are shown first, then experimented with for the puzzles the player characters need to solve to progress or earn loot. Our next step is to establish the Mega Dungeon's roots, providing some lore and background on the region. This is rather straightforward. Allow me to set the scene. The city of Valdrain, the jewel of the desert, was often considered to be a myth. But like all myth, it had descended from a legend, forged in the crucible of history, and now lost to the sands of time, an eternal mystery. In more recent times, a group of explorers from Port Aprinas had engaged in a more thorough search throughout the desert, chasing after rumours of tombs they could map out for gold and other treasures. They reported that deep in a previously uncharted part of this desert, they had found a large, seemingly abandoned ancient city located in an oasis chain. They drew up an initial map of the city and its location within the desert. After these explorers had arrived back, the Adventurers Guild in Kermor, upon being requested to do so by the Port Aprinas Explorers Guild, established an archaeological convoy to survey, study the ancient city, and to discover and recover any ancient artifacts. Our glorious party has been drafted into the expedition survey, funded by the leader of the Kermor Adventurers Guild, and upon arrival our players will be assigned the main task of thoroughly exploring and documenting the main fortress in the ancient city by the captain of the team. The next consideration will be the art style for the maps depicting the rooms, and this is where things could really go off the rails in a fun manner. We could go with something more realistic, or try to do something a little more cartoony, and there are a lot of options besides those. Or I could commit the ultimate atrocity in the art world, deny myself the learning opportunity to try out alternative art styles, and use some of that weird AI art nonsense which... Uh, You know what? The less said about AI art, the better. For our maps, since a the key theme for the dungeon is cartography and exploration, we're going to use tools that make sense for the setting. In this case, charcoal pencils on paper are our means of for drawing up these maps. With all of that out of the way, let's begin designing the Mega Dungeon. Or rather, recapping how the design in January went. Does it count as a room if we're describing an overview map for the region where the dungeon is located? 
I'm going to rule yes for now, as this allows for a game master to set up potential random encounters with the denizens of the desert if they so choose. It also establishes the topography of the landscape around the Mega Dungeon, and allows us to name the local cities. Towards the southern area we have the city of Kermor, where the expedition and subsequently the party begins the adventure. It is connected by road to Port Aprinus, located in a nestled nook to the north that joins the open ocean, being a somewhat central trade hub. And in the middle of the desert, we have Valderheim, the city which has our proper mega dungeon. The second room we'll design is a more detailed overview of Valderheim itself, and includes some of the oasis chain where the abandoned city is. This also sets up the general appearance of the main fortress where the party will be spending most of the time exploring as part of the adventure we're conjuring. An eight-pronged fort with a pair of collapsed towers marking the would-be entrance to the mega dungeon. We also dot around some extra buildings, a lot of extra buildings, outside of the fortress, as these will be occupying the rest of the expedition crew, ensuring that this was once a place of commerce and residence in equal measure. We next create several rooms to detail the base camp established by the expedition convoy. This also serves as the party's residence, and provides trading opportunities for supplies and rations in exchange for progress made towards exploring the party's assigned area for the expedition. We'll also include a wizard in the convoy to identify any magic items the party finds, in the event that the party doesn't include one. Also, I apologize in advance that I haven't drafted up any art for the NPCs created for the base camp in this video. Hindsight is 2020, as they say. However, we can always figure out some art for the NPCs later. Room 3, for example, is the tent for the expedition's captain, Harala Fiak. This also brings us to a consideration for creating these NPCs. That being that we can boil the design down to gender, race, class, position within the expedition's leadership, and general mannerisms, as though they are following a template for a PC for now. We are trying to design this to be as system agnostic as possible. Harala himself would be a human bard, someone who likes to gather stories from the ancient past, and constantly carries himself with a strong sense of cheer. It is also worth mentioning that we can always replace the NPCs with ones more suitable for whichever system or setting is being ran. Room 4 is the tent for identifying discovered magical artifacts, usually occupied by the lizardfolk wizard Ioyad. Not much is known about her, other than her consistent and deliberate choice to be enigmatic, and opting to always dress in excessive robes even in the desert heat. The fifth room is the portable kitchen, manned by Zirul Stonehof. He might be a Minotaur Barbarian, but let's have some fun with subverting the expectations. On top of dressing nicely, he's highly respectful and polite, eager to exchange stories whilst he's cooking your meal for you. Our sixth room is the Field Hospital, and we're going to go slightly off the rails with using a Half-Elf Battlemaster who is extremely talented with healing kits, alchemist supplies and herbalism kits. Effectively a medieval doctor who knows exactly what she's doing to treat injuries and perform field surgery if needed. Her name is Red Raven Morris, and whilst she is polite enough, she often speaks in cryptic riddles alluding to how complicated good medical practices can be. Room 7 depicts the expedition's tent for the cartographer, a human called Professor Juarez Adelton. He is something of a retired wizard, although he won't bring it up unless someone asks about the spellbook he keeps on display on his desk. Although highly inquisitive, he does get into arguments with Ioyad, and subsequently those two wizards do not get along. The next several rooms are dedicated to either other tents for the others in the convoy, or to the carts that carry various supplies for the camp. For instance, our tenth room is a barrel cart, carrying either water or booze for the convoy. Several of these tents also contain locked chests, so if your party is willing to cop some flag from the convoy, or some of their fellow adventurers, there could well be profit in it. Oh sure, some of these rooms are cards containing more barrels or crates of supplies, but this is a rather large expedition, and most of the NPCs do talk to each other. Plus, there's a lot of them. So, probably not worth it unless your lockpicking expert is looking strictly to practice their skills. Speaking of practicing lockpicking, we've arrived at the 16th room. This particular storage crate is being looked after by one of the convoy guards, a human rogue that goes by Morgan Talos. He keeps something of a vigilant eye out, but is happy for any would-be thief to try to lockpick his chest. This chest has a rather high DC, although this DC will decrease with each failed attempt, up to a maximum of three times. 
clearing or failing it reveals that the chest is a friendly mimic, who likes to give adventurers advice on how to spot other mimics, traps and chest, and general lockpicking advice. This will translate to a temporary bonus to lockpicking checks for the rest of the adventure. Let's get back to drawing up another room for the last cart the convoy took of them for supplies. We've got another barrel and some more storage crates for supplies. I followed this up with designing three more tents for more of the expedition's NPCs. Our next two rooms of the dungeon are two possible tents intended for the party, depending on how big the group is. We can also dedicate one of these tents to a rival adventuring party if you want to add some additional intrigue to the base camp. The 23rd room is the tent for the convoy guards, those that stay with the base camp in the event of imminent danger to the convoy. After all, the expedition does have to somehow return to Kermor once they have finished documenting the ancient city. Plus, there are probably unknown dangers out here, lurking within and without the city of Valderheim. We finish the overview of the base camp with the 24th room, which depicts the layout of the base camp in all of its temporary glory. It is worth mentioning that I didn't exactly draw the city of Valderheim, nor the base camp in the map for the second room to scale. Yeah, I'm totally sure that won't come back up as a teehee funny haha surprise later. No siree, no chance of that happening. But hey, this is supposed to be a mega dungeon we're exploring, right? So for our 25th room, why don't we make some progress towards that? We have the local oasis closest to the expedition's base camp. Even though it looks peaceful, there is an ambush lying in wait for the unwary. If anyone ventures too close to the shore of the oasis, we have a potential combat encounter with a giant undead crab, which will emerge from the watery depths below. Since the party isn't too far away from the camp, the DM can have the guards come in to provide assistance if necessary. We now move on to our first street section on the road to the collapsed entrance to the central fortress. The buildings in this area are internally barricaded, requiring strength checks to break down the doors or dex checks to slip in a sword or something in the gap to lever out the cade. These buildings, despite being hard to access, contain very little. The party can also get a view of one of the intact gates of the city's citadel. Our second section of street features a stable just outside one of the intact gates to the central fortress. This section has several skeletons lying on the ground, which rise and form a combat encounter if one of the players decides to investigate the skeletons further. Speaking of the stable, the doors for it are not barricaded. If the party decides to enter and investigate, they could find old paper sheets in the desk detailing purchases of horses. The party can also find dried out and decayed hay on the ground where the animals were once kept. Moving past the stable, our third road section features a section of the road which circles around more of the main fortress walls. Here, our party gets its first view of the ruined section of the citadel walls, and can see yet more scattered skeletons. I mean, it's an ancient city, abandoned for a long time, and was once occupied by living people. The presence of undead and yet more skeletons, however, suggests that something more sinister is afoot. Our next room details the section of the road a party would explore if they decided to follow the road to get another angle on the ruined walls, or to manoeuvre around the piles of bones to attempt to avoid unnecessary fights with the reanimated. I decided when I finished this to save the collapsed fortress entrance for the first room of February for the Mega Dungeon. If the party decides to circle around the entrance to get another angle on the fortress and to keep doing some cartography, we have our last room for January, featuring a seemingly major intersection of roads besides one of the still intact gates on the other side of the ruined section of wall. With this last room, there is a need for a new consideration. Some of the days in January, unfortunately, suffered from an issue of designer block when it came to direction, and I need a method to get around that. We need to be able to provide some direction to the room being designed. I found that usually the hardest step to designing any of the rooms was figuring out where to start from. This led to a thought experiment which resulted in me designing a rather primitive system by which to use dice to help design our rooms. The main idea is that in the event that I encounter more designer block, whilst designing more of the rooms in the dungeon, I can refer to this system to give me that initial starting point. All things accounted for, this system is primarily intended as a backup plan as it does run the risk of accidentally conflicting with rooms that have already been made. That's where we conclude this first part of Design Floor for 2024. Next time we'll go over the rooms constructed in February, including the extra room for the leap year. 
Thanks for watching the video mates, and be sure to like and subscribe. Do feel free to leave a comment down below if you have a suggestion for the Mega Dungeon proper, or even feedback for improving what's been designed here. Again, thanks for watching mates, and I shall see you all in the video for the February runes.